Okay, um, thanks so much. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for putting together such a nice workshop and inviting me to participate. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, affine manifolds uh, and some of the group actions uh, used to, to construct such manifolds. Um, let me start by introducing the affine group. So, uh, start with a, a real vector space, uh, Rn. I'll denote by f of Rn um, the group of invertible affine transformations. So those maps of the form x maps to ax plus b, uh, where a is an invertible linear map, an element of gln, and this is called the, the linear part uh, of this affine transformation. And B is a translation vector uh, called the translational part. OK, so I think we've all thought about affine transformations before in some elementary course. Just to remind you, they include things like pure translations of Rn, uh, Euclidean motions, rotations, reflections, things like that. Um, and also uh, transformations that, to our Euclidean point of view, seem to distort Rn, like shears and uh, stretching, dilation, uh, Lorentzian transformations, things like that. Uh, and of course, any compositions of such, such things are also affine transformations. Um, as a group, it's a semi-direct product. F of Rn is the semi-direct product of GLN uh, with Rn, um, which is to say that when you compose two affine transformations, their linear parts compose as usual, but their translational parts don't quite add. They add with a twisting by the linear part. OK? All right. So. Um, what I want to talk about today are, um, are what are called proper affine actions. So let gamma be a discrete group. OK. Um, so I want to study proper affine uh, actions. And these are, of course, uh, actions on some Rn um, uh, by affine transformations. Okay, so you have some, some representation into the affine group which defines this action, um, which, are, which are properly discontinuous. Um, okay. Um, and of course, properly discontinuous, as we all know, is, is precisely the condition uh, so that we can take a nice quotient um, by the action, the, the orbit space um, of the action as a nice Hausdorff manifold or, or more generally an orbifold. Um, so, uh, I'm sorry, orbifold. This orbifold or manifold has, a, has an affine structure naturally coming from the quotient. Uh, and that affine structure is, is complete uh, in the sense that um, the geodesic flow coming from parallel translation on Rn is, is complete. So um, complete affine manifolds are in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, proper affine actions. So I'm going to study, uh, study these things more from the, the uh, group action point of view rather than the, the orbifold point of view. Okay. Um, what are some examples of these things? Uh, let me give you some examples um, coming from sub-geometries of affine geometry that I think many of you have, have thought about. Uh, okay, so I'll make a little table. Sub-geometry and um, possible gamma, okay. So, uh, first of all, I could, I, could, I could work with the translation subgroup. 
Okay, so if I, if I want to build proper actions by translations, um, it's clear what to do. I take k translations, uh, and provided that they're linearly independent, I'll get a nice copy of z to the k uh, acting properly by translations on Rn, okay? If k equals n, I'll, I'll make in the quotient um, a complete affine uh, n torus. Okay? Um, another uh, well-known sub-geometry of affine geometry is Euclidean. So if I, if I uh, study proper, affine, uh, proper Euclidean actions, um, this is a uh, sort of well-studied subject that was described... Uh, yeah, um, there's powerful theorems of, of Bieberbach from the early 1900s, I think 1911, which say that, well, the groups that are able to act properly by Euclidean transformations are all virtually abelian. In particular, if the action is co-compact, then uh, gamma is virtually z to the n acting by translations, like in the first case. So we don't get much more interesting discrete groups acting um, using Euclidean transformations. However, if we, if we allow ourselves to use some slightly more complicated affine transformations, which distort Rn um, a little bit, uh, we can get some more interesting groups. Um, so there are examples coming from the uh, three-dimensional Thurston geometries, nil, and Sol, these are both sub-geometries of affine geometry as well. In fact, these are, these are the only three for which that's true. Um, and uh, so, so any, any uh, complete three-dimensional nil manifold or Sol manifold uh, is actually a complete affine manifold as well. And the fundamental groups of these things uh, are nilpotent, but not abelian in the case of nil, uh, and solvable, but not nilpotent in the case of sol. So um, even using some slightly complicated looking affine transformations, um, we're still only able to get solvable group actions here. Um, so the theme of this talk is, is to explore the question of what other discrete groups gamma are able to act properly by affine transformations. So I really just want to know, there's of course a lot of interesting questions about what those proper actions might look like, but let's just try to figure out which gammas uh, admit proper actions, proper affine actions. There's a famous conjecture having to do with this. Um, it's now known as the Auslander conjecture. It goes back to work of Auslander in the 60s, I think 64. Um, and it says that if gamma admits an action on Rn, which is proper affine and co-compact, then gamma is virtually solvable. Okay, so... Um, this is known, this conjecture is known, let me just say right away, this conjecture is known up to dimension n equals 6 now by some recent work of Abels, Margulis, and Seufer. But it remains wide open in, in general, and I think it's, well, it seems like it's pretty hard. Um, I don't know. So let's think about the conjecture a little bit. So first of all, in this setting of linear groups, um, as Moon had mentioned, uh, virtually solvable is the same thing as saying that gamma, uh, let's see, does not contain a free group of rank, um, right, free group of rank R greater than or equal to 2. In other words, a, a non abelian free group. Okay. So the, the intuition, the naive intuition might be well, Affine geometry is clearly a little more flexible than Euclidean geometry, but it's still flat, and so it shouldn't have enough room inside of it for big, complicated groups to act properly. Okay, I think that's the, the intuition 
that Aslander sort of had in the, in the 60s. Um, now, the problem is that it's, things are actually a bit more subtle than you might think at first. So, in fact, you know, liberally applied, that intuition is, is wrong um, because Margulis in 1983 found examples um, of proper affine actions um, by free groups uh, in dimension three. Okay, so free groups are not solvable. They're, in a sense, big and complicated. Um, but they can still act properly um, by affine transformations. They still emit proper affine actions. The quotients by these, by these free group actions in R3 are now popularly known as Margulis space times. Um, space times because there's a Lorentzian metric in the background that I don't want to discuss right now. Um, and they've, you know, a lot of people, including my, myself and my collaborators, have been studying these things and, and um, getting a better understanding of them over the, over the years. Um, okay. I also want to say uh, Abels, Margulis, and Seufer have also studied certain free group actions in higher dimensions and, and you know, found some situations where they, again, occur in higher dimensions. Uh, and more recently, Ilya Smilga has been studying proper affine actions by free groups where the linear part um, lies in the adjoint representation of some semi-simple Lie group. And that's the context that we'll work in um, coming up today. OK, um, two remarks at this point. So in case it's not clear, um, these examples of Margulis are not counterexamples to the Auslander conjecture. The quotient um, of R3 by these proper free group actions are not compact. OK, and why is that? Well, it's, it's for a very simple reason. The free group doesn't have high enough dimension. The virtual cohomological dimension of the free group is 1, and 1 is less than 3. So if the action was co-compact, you'd see, at least in some finite cover, you'd see some cohomology in, in dimension 3. The free group doesn't, doesn't have any, um, so that's not possible. OK. So if you want to if you want to disprove the Auslander conjecture, if you want to find counterexamples, you should find some some discrete subgroups gamma or some some discrete groups gamma with higher dimension that are able to to act properly by affine transformations. Okay, so the next remark is that there's essentially no other examples known um, at this point. So no other examples of non virtually solvable discrete groups that emit proper affine actions, except for dumb things you can do with the free group. You could take a product of two free groups and let it act on R6. Um, you can make a proper action that way. You can take some finite extensions and do various things. Um, but essentially, there's no other source of, of any uh, non-solvable proper affine actions. OK. Um, yeah? OK. Um, okay, so the main theorem, and this is joint with Francois Guerreteau, Guerreteau and Fanny Castle, um, gives, a, gives a, a, a new source of, of lots of, of discrete groups that emit proper affine actions. So um, a whole new class of groups um, are able to do this. The theorem is any... Right angled Coxeter group. Uh, maybe I'll save some room right over here. Okay, um, I'm going to abbreviate that RACG from now on. Admits a proper affine action. Rn, and some affine space Rn, 
where here n is k choose 2, and k is the number of generators of the, of the Coxeter group. Okay, so this gives um, many new examples of discrete groups that emit proper affine actions. And as was alluded to in, in Ian's talk this morning, um, these groups are, are very interesting groups. They have a rich subgroup structure. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're very, even though they're relatively uncomplicated to define, they're, they're actually quite interesting groups. Okay, so as a corollary, uh, we get proper affine actions by surface groups. Why is that? Because the right angled pentagon group uh, contains a surface group. Okay, these have cohomological dimension too. Uh, we get proper actions by hyperbolic three manifold groups. Uh, these have a cohomological dimension three. This, of course, uses. Um, Nagel's virtual specialness theorem. Um, okay. And in general, we, we, get, uh, we get actions, uh, proper affine actions by hyperbolic groups, word hyperbolic groups um, of arbitrarily large uh, cohomological dimension. That's using uh, the work of Janiskevich and uh, Sviatkowski, which says that there's actually right angle Coxeter groups which are hyperbolic and have arbitrarily large uh, VCD. That's still something that kind of amazes me, but it's true. Okay. Um, okay, any questions about this statement? Okay. Um, Great, so let me now show you how to do this. We can construct these very directly. Um, okay. Right, so these are definitely not co-compacted. So none of these are counterexamples to this conjecture. Um, they're pretty far from being co-compact. Um, it turns out it's not easy, uh, not, not hard um, to see that the, the virtual cohomological dimension of a Coxeter group is definitely bounded by the number of generators. Um, and of course, the dimension of the affine space is quadratic in the number of generators. So these are, in a sense, quadratically far away from being co-compact. Um, but nonetheless, you know, it shows that there's actually a lot of groups that emit proper affine actions. I, I don't claim that these are the, I don't claim that this is the smallest dimensional affine space that these could act on. It's just, we just have found some examples. So, you know, figuring out whether this conjecture is true might, might come down to sort of a race between cohomological dimension of the groups and the dimension of the affine space they're able to fit inside of. Okay. Okay, so, all right, so let me, let me describe how to make these, these proper affine actions. Start by reminding you what a right-angled Coxeter group is. So it's a group, we'll call it, instead of gamma, we'll call it W now, because um, that's what's commonly done in the literature. I think W is for, for vial. Um, it's a group, uh, with k generators, let's say, uh, gamma 1 up to gamma, gay, uh, gamma k, which are all uh, order 2, okay? Um, and then uh, there may be some additional relations in the group of the form uh, for each i not equal to j, there might be a relation of the form gamma i gamma j equals gamma j gamma i. In other words, the i and j generators commute. Or there might be no relation. 
Okay, so it's just a group, it's a group generated by k uh, involutions, uh, some of which commute and others of which don't. Okay, so here's a simple example which we'll use to illustrate the sort of uh, inspiration for this, this technique um, coming from the setting of Margulis spacetimes. Um, okay, it's a, it's a right angle Coxeter group with three generators. Okay. Of course, they all, um, they're all order two as required. And then I'm going to add just one more relation that the, that the first and third generators commute. Okay? But I'm not going to uh, impose any relation on, say, the first and second or the second and third generators. Okay? So this is a very uh, uncomplicated example of a right angled Coxeter group. Um, now, how do we think of these geometrically? Well, a right angled Coxeter group is supposed to be a, a group generated by reflections in some right angled polytope. That's, it's, like an, it's an abstraction of that geometric uh, idea. Um, and in this case, this right angled Coxeter group can be realized as a reflection group in the hyperbolic plane. So let me draw a picture over here. Okay, so here's the hyperbolic plane. And I want to think of it in the projective model. I'm thinking of it as lying inside of RP2. It's, it's a round disk in RP2. Okay. So now um, I'm going to draw um, a, a reflection uh, triangle. So here are two walls meeting at a right angle. And then a third wall uh, here, which doesn't meet either of these two walls inside of the hyperbolic plane. Of course, I've, I've extended the, the walls to, to meet outside of the hyperbolic plane um, past infinity. Um, it's just convenient uh, for drawing this picture in the, in the projective space. OK. So how do I see this group in this picture? Well, I'm going to think of gamma 1 as reflection in this wall. I'm going to think of gamma 2 as reflection in this wall. And I'm going to think of gamma 3 as reflection in this wall. And then, of course, when I reflect in the first wall, and then I reflect in the third wall, I get the same thing as when I reflect in the third wall and then reflect in the first wall. And that's precisely the, the relation that I wanted to have in the group. Okay, so the right angle gives me the, the commutativity relation that I wanted. And then no other relations appear by accident. Okay, I can reflect in, say, this copy of the second wall. Um, and it sort of, you know, goes in its own direction from there. Okay. Um, great. So, so this is a geometric sort of realization of this group as, a, as an actual reflection group. So it gives me a, a representation of the Coxeter group into PO21, uh, which is the isometry group of the hyperbolic plane, which is a discrete embedding, in fact. OK, so, so realizing this group as a, as a reflection group allows me to think of this group as, as a discrete group inside of PO21. But in fact, there's actually a whole moduli of choices in the way that I constructed this, this uh, fundamental domain. Uh, in fact, since, since wall number two doesn't meet wall number one, I get to choose the distance, V12, between these two walls. And I get to choose the distance, D23, between wall number two and wall number three. And if I adjust those distances, say by moving the second wall closer in or tilting it a little bit or moving it out, I get a different picture. So the, the tiling generated by all these reflections uh, will look a little bit deformed. So I actually get a two-parameter family of essentially different representations here, uh, parameterized by these two distances. Okay. 
great. So that's very good because there's actually a very straightforward way to produce affine actions from deformations of, dis of discrete embeddings in Lie groups. So let me explain how that works. OK. Oh, I'm sorry, affine actions. OK. Um, OK, so for this, uh, this is more general than, than just this situation here. So let's let G be a semi-simple uh, Lie group. Let's say it has trivial center. Um, I'll denote by frac G the Lie algebra. Um, OK, so, so definition. An infinitesimal uh, deformation of a discrete embedding rho from some discrete group gamma uh, into G is a lift. OK, so I've got gamma. It's embedded in G. It's a lift up to the tangent bundle of G. I'll call that phi. OK, so it's essentially it's just an assignment of tangent vectors. If I think of gamma as being a bunch of points inside of G, I'm now going to assign tangent vectors to each point in G so that the group laws um, and relations all hold to first order. Um, OK, so it's just a formal assignment of tangent vectors. OK, um, great. So the point is now that, well, the tangent bundle of G is just the semi-direct product as a group. It's just the semi-direct product of the Lie group G with its Lie algebra, uh, frac G, twisted by the, the adjoint representation. OK, so infinitesimal deformation really has two pieces. It's got the, the original discrete embedding rho. And it's got a function u, a map u, that assigns elements of the Lie algebra to each, to each element of, of the group gamma. It's not a homomorphism. It's twisted. It's what's called a rho cocycle. OK. And this gives you an affine action simply because uh, this semi-direct product naturally uh, it goes inside of uh, the general linear group of the Lie algebra. So now we just think of the Lie algebra as a vector space. With the usual twisting now, with the standard twisting, and this is just this is just the affine group of the Lie algebra thought of as a copy of R n. Okay, um, so so essentially, to be really explicit, um, the affine action on the Lie algebra is just. Um, gamma acts on V by the adjoint uh, action of rho of gamma on V plus U of gamma. So linear part is the adjoint action of rho. Translational part is this cocycle of U. OK. Um, OK, so purely formally, any, uh, any, infinite, any infinitesimal deformation of a discrete embedding uh, gives me an affine action. So in particular here, we get, a, we get many, by taking tangent vectors to this two-parameter family, we get many affine actions. Of course, there's no reason for any one of them to be proper. Um, so what we'd really like to have is some way to understand the dynamics of the affine action uh, in terms of the geometry of the infinitesimal deformation. Something like as long as the as long as the infinitesimal deformation does x, y, and z, then the affine action will be proper. Okay, so there's no such, you know, well at least not a complete dictionary um, developed yet for such questions. 
Um, except in the case where G is PO21, um, then work of Goldman, Labry, and Margulis, and also myself with, with Francois Guerrero and Fanny Castle, have completely determined exactly when the, the corresponding affine action is, is proper, and it has to do with um, it has to do with whether or not this co-cycle, this, this infinitesimal deformation is contracting, is shrinking the geometry. So um, let me show you in this example how to make that work, um, and then we'll, we'll generalize that to the, to the general case. Okay, so I'll also, you know, people tend to think this like formal, uh, this sort of formal translation from infinitesimal deformation to affine action is kind of, you know, not so intuitive to think about. I'll tell you a, a very intuitive way to think about this affine action, and I hope uh, in, in a minute, and I hope that it will seem uh, it will seem intuitive after that. Okay, so um, yeah. No, I, I'm not saying that. Um, in this case, we I, I showed you how to make a two-parameter family of deformations. I can take a tangent vector to that family, and that will give me such a co-cycle. But sometimes there might only be the zero co-cycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are these are really um, yeah. These are elements in the first cohomology with twisted coefficients. You know, in in this algebra, yeah. Yeah, so if that cohomology is trivial, then there's nothing to do here. Yeah. 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 Yeah, definitely. It, it, yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, okay. So I told you very vaguely that, that getting a proper affine action over here has to do with some sort of contraction of geometry over here. So what I'm going to do in this picture is I'm going to I'm going to take a path where these distances are shrinking. Okay, so let's let's choose d12 equals some constant capital D minus t, and let's let d23 be the same the same thing. These are the distances in the hyperbolic metric between these two geodesics. Okay, so it doesn't. Because I'm drawing this in the projective model, it, it looks like these geodesics touch each other, but that's, that's at infinity. So there's actually some shortest distance between them. OK. So I've got these distances. These are, these are orthogonal distances. Um, I think the projective model is sort of unfairly unpopular. I think it's really nice. Um, anyway, but the angles don't look nice. Um, OK. So. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm choosing these distances to be equal and shrinking at rate one. Okay, so this gives me uh, now a path, row T, of representations, discrete embeddings into PO21. I take the derivative of that path. Okay, that's an infinite, that gives me an infinitesimal deformation, phi, which is. Uh, which is the discrete embedding row zero with the tangent information u, where u is some, some row co-cycle, deci uh, describing to first order how the group is deforming as I push these walls together. Okay? So, uh, yeah, so in this, in this um, what do I want to say? Yeah, so, so here u... Uh, It's a, a, a frac G valued cocycle. Here, frac G is just the Lie algebra of O2, 1, which we'll think of now as the killing vector fields on the hyperbolic plane. They're, they're infinitesimal isometries. They're vector fields whose flow is isometric to first order. Okay? So, what is this cocycle telling us? It's telling us something very um, concrete in this case. If I apply it to one of my generators, one of my reflections, it's telling me the infinitesimal motion of the corresponding reflection wall. Okay, so of course there's some choice about how to normalize here. Let's, let's, um, 
let's keep wall number one and three fixed and just move wall two uh, so that these distances shrink. My co-cycle, uh, when I apply it to gamma two, will tell me how this wall is moving. So it literally gives me a vector field on the entire hyperbolic plane, but if I restrict it to this wall, I see some picture like this. Okay, I see a vector field just telling me how the wall is moving. Okay, and of course this co-cycle, uh, it's not you know, just random, it doesn't have just random values, it has to obey a certain equivariance. So you see that if this wall is moving like this, then of course um, this copy of the same wall has to move similarly. Same over here. Okay, so you see these four tiles are shrinking towards the center. What about this tile? Well, note that this, the co-cycle is not actually invariant. It's not just the image of this vector field over here um, because it has to take into account the, the deformation of the group. So really, since this wall is moving in this way, uh, these two walls need to move even faster towards this wall. So this tile is both shrinking and moving towards the center of the picture. Okay, and similarly, if you were to draw the rest of the tiling, tiles very far away from the center of this picture would be shrinking, just like this tile is, and moving very rapidly towards the, towards the center of the picture. So you see this sort of contraction focused on the origin here, okay? Okay, so, um, so what I'll do now you know, I won't tell you how to do this, it's straightforward in this situation, um, is I'm just gonna extend this vector field to the entire tiling. Um, it's only defined on the walls right now, but let's just extend it inside in some reasonable way. Um, so I'm gonna, so I want it to, it's, it's a vector field now defined on um, all of the tiling. So. I guess I should name, let's name this first tile delta. So the orbit of the, of the tile actually covers the entire hyperbolic plane. I, I actually want to think of it as a, a bigger convex set inside of RP2, um, but it, it contains H2, so it's fine to just think about the hyperbolic plane right now. Um, okay, and of course, you know, similar to the co-cycle, to, to these vector fields on the walls that we drew, it, it satisfies an, an equivariance uh, an equivariance property, um, which is also, also called automorphic sometimes. Okay, so I've got this vector field, and you know, it's not really important uh, what it does on small scale, uh, but at large scale, it's really, it's really pushing points in faraway tiles together very quickly. So I won't say precisely what this means, but it's, it's uniformly contracting. So as a heuristic picture, uh, here's a point in one tile, here's a point in a faraway tile. Those points should be moving uh, such that they're, the distance between them is shrinking to first order at a rate roughly proportional to the, to the distance apart. Okay, that's, that's satisfied in this, in this uh, in this picture. Okay, so I promised you I would tell you how to think about the corresponding affine action and how to see immediately that it's properly discontinuous. So let me do that um, over here. Okay. So remember, uh, in this correspondence, the affine space that we're acting on in the end is the Lie algebra. I'd rather think um, now, instead of thinking of the Lie algebra, I want to think of an affine subspace of the space of deformation vector fields. So I'm going to consider my affine space to be X, my, my deformation vector field, describing this particular deformation. And then I want to subtract, I'm going to don't worry about the minus sign. You could just think add. It just makes things work out a little nicer. I'm going to 
add or subtract from x any infinitesimal isometry, any, any killing vector field. Okay, so you can, you know, if I, as we already said, there was some choice about whether, you know, what walls number one and three did. You know, I, of course I could sort of add a drift here. I could just add an uh, isometric vector field that makes this whole picture drift. Um, that's essentially, you know, that's the, the infinitesimal version of, of conjugating, of conjugating my, my discrete embedding. Um, and if I do that, the vector field looks totally different, but it still has the same contraction properties because I'm adding an isometric vector field there. So I should say x minus v is um, a different deformation vector field, but it's still uniformly contracting with the same constants. Okay, so, you know, essentially by the, by the Brouwer fixed point theorem, or the vector field version of that, if I add, a, if I add a, a, a killing field, this picture, you know, it doesn't look like this anymore. It's not centered nicely in the origin, but it focuses somewhere else. It has, a, it has a zero. It has a tile that doesn't move very much, and the rest of the tiles move very quickly towards that, towards that tile. Um, Um, yeah, okay, so there exists a, a tile, rho zero gamma delta, so the gamma translate of the, of the base tile, uh, all right, which moves least. Um, under x minus v. Um, and all other tiles move toward it. So essentially, when I when I add a killing field, the picture refocuses somewhere else on some other tile, perhaps far away, but it's still essentially the same picture. You know, one or maybe four tiles not moving very much, and all the others um, contracting towards that towards that tile. Okay, so this is going to be this is going to tell me immediately that the action is proper. So let me let me say what the action is now. So in this in this setting, so this we think of this as an affine subspace of the deformation vector fields. And what's the what's the action? Um, the action. Uh, is is I uh, take uh, let's see I have an element of the group and I act on this deformation vector field. Well, what can I possibly do? I have a vector field. I'm just going to use deck transformations by the original um, discrete embedding and just lift up the picture and move it and put it back down. Okay, so that in symbols is uh, this. Okay, and this, if you, if you work it out, is precisely x minus the adjoint action of rho zero of gamma on v plus u of gamma. Okay, so you see, it's, I think it's more convenient to think of the affine space as a subspace of the space of vector fields, um, but really we're just doing um, that same affine action that I wrote down before. Okay, so uh, let's see. So why is it proper? Well. If you just think about it for a minute, it, you know, it looks pretty proper, right? I've got a vector field with a zero here. I pick it up and no other zeros. It's very big everywhere else. I pick it up and I move it far away and put it back down. Now it looks totally different. It has a zero somewhere else very far away. And in this original compact portion of the picture that I was looking at, it's now enormous. Okay, so essentially that's the proof. 
um, you can formalize that. Um, so the action on uh, x minus g um, is proper. Uh, you can formalize that idea by saying, OK, I'm just going to define a projection from uh, x minus g down to the group. Um, it's going to be equivariant uh, with respect to the affine action up here and just left multiplication down here. And all it does is it takes x minus v and it maps it to the tile um, for which x minus v is, is focusing on. Okay? So essentially it maps it to the zero of the vector field. Okay, so the action down here is proper, so the action up here is also proper. Okay, um, all right. Any questions about that? Okay, so that's the basic idea behind everything that happens in, in Margulis space times, actually. Um, all, you know, Margulis space times don't involve, you know, reflection groups usually, but, um, but essentially this type of contraction is what's producing all, all uh, proper affine actions by, by free groups on R3. Of course, note that the Lie algebra of, of PO21 is, is a three-dimensional affine space. Okay, so we want to do this now. We want to do this in general for any right-angled Coxeter group. Um, okay, let's go here. Okay, so it would be nice if we could just do the same thing and find a reflection, uh, a reflection polytope uh, in hyperbolic n space for any right angled Coxeter group. Um, as far as I know, that's. I don't know if that's possible, actually. Um, it may not be known, but I think it's unlikely that that, that that would be true. So we need to use some other source of, of uh, discrete embeddings of, of right angle Coxeter groups uh, to try to do this. So, okay, general uh, right angle Coxeter group, uh, W. Okay, so got K generators. Okay, so luckily there, there is a very nice source of, of, of representations of a right angle Coxeter group, um, and any Coxeter group really, um, coming from a construction of, that goes back to tits really, um, I think, you know, things like this construction were studied by, by Vinberg as well, and, and more recently, um, these very representations that I'll tell you about were studied by uh, someone named Kramer in 94, and also very recently by Dyer, Ripple, and Holweg in, uh, well, a series of papers um, sort of around 2013, and I think still, still continuing. Um, their work is in the setting of, of Katsumudi algebras, um, but really they, they're describing some of the very geometry that we'll need for this, uh, for this construction. Okay, so what's, it's, it's very simple. What's the construction? Okay, so I'm going to choose, yeah, so if I have two generators which don't commute, as I did over there, I'm going to choose a distance dij greater than zero, okay? And then I'm gonna define by linear form B, e, um, okay, that takes into account those, those uh, distances. Um, and from my bilinear form, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess maybe I'll write it. The, the, the bilinear form B of EI EJ will be zero 
if the, gen if the corresponding generators commute. So the face is dual to EI and EJ meet at a right angle. Otherwise, uh, let's say minus cosh of DIJ. Uh, if not, remember we picked a DIJ specifically for this purpose. Okay, now I get a representation, um, rho, which depends, uh, which depends on my choices. Simply sends uh, x, uh, let's see, uh, gamma sends x to x minus 2, uh, sorry, I guess gamma i, the i generator, does the usual um, it's just a, just a reflection, standard reflection uh, in the dual to the, to the basis vector EI using this bilinear form. Okay, great. So, of course, so this is you know, secretly exactly what we did in this setting. Um, it just so happens that the, uh, the representation landed in a nice copy of PO21. Here, it may be that the signature of this bilinear form, well, we can't control it. So it may not be N1. It's going to be some PQ. Okay, so the signature of B is PQ, some PQ. And so, uh, and that'll, that'll remain constant, at least for... Um, an open set of choices of the distances. Um, so I can think, uh, let's see, yeah. Um, okay, before I deform this, let me just say that, okay, so what, so what is the analog of the hyperbolic plane here? So we don't have a nice picture in hyperbolic geometry. Um, the orthogonal group of our, of our form is a copy of OPQ, or I guess I should say P. POPQ, um, but there is a nice replacement for hyperbolic geometry here. This acts on what's called HPQ minus one. It's the semi Ramanian uh, hyperbolic space um, of signature PQ minus one. Okay. Um, so this is a really nice geometry. If you like hyperbolic geometry, it's a lot like hyperbolic geometry, except that its metric is not definite. It's semi-Ramanian. So some distances are negative, some are zero. Here's a picture of one of my favorite examples, um, H21, which is also known by the name uh, anti de Sitter three space. Okay, so it's projective three space, it's um, the inside of a, of, a, of a quadric. Okay, and I'll just say at any given point, the tangent, in the tangent space, there's a cone of directions that have length zero. Inside that cone, uh, those directions have negative length. So for example, this geodesic has negative length. But outside the cone, the directions have positive length. So for example, this geodesic has positive length. Okay, so working with a, with a semi-Ramanian metric is quite annoying, as you can imagine, but it's the best we've got here. So, um, so what do we do? Uh, okay, yeah. So let me say, these representations uh, have a nice convex geometry associated to them. So in fact, the dual planes to the, to the standard basis with respect to B, um, yeah, form a nice simplex. So this is really a realization uh, of W as the, reflect, as, a, as the group generated by reflections um, in a K simplex, delta, uh, contained in RPK minus one. Okay, so let me draw that here. This is a lie, but let's pretend it looks like this. 
Okay, so here's delta. Okay, and it's got, it's got a, a reflection face for each generator. Um, and when you take the orbit under, the, under this discrete embedding, it fills out a convex domain. Okay, omega is the, the orbit here. Okay, so like in this picture, um, we had a nice um, tiling of a convex set in RP2. Similarly, we get a, a tiling of a convex set in RPK minus one. I'm drawing it as if it's contained inside of this HPQ minus one. It might not be, but you can work with it anyway. Um, okay, and now, uh, we're going to deform. Uh, now we're going to deform this picture and try to make it contract like we did here. Let's see if we can get a, a proper action. So let me say this very quickly. Um, again, I'm going to choose the dij to be some constant d minus t for all ij, for all relevant ij. Okay. Now, it's a little harder to see what it means that these faces are coming closer together in this picture. Um, but let me not say more about that at the moment. Um, okay, so I take the, so I get from this a path of representations, uh, really discrete embeddings, into uh, POPQ. Okay, um, and I take the derivative. Along this path, by the way, I see this, this delta, this, this reflection simplex start deforming, and the corresponding convex set also deforms. Um, I take the derivative of my path at t equals zero. I get a deformation co-cycle u. And again, the values of u describe how the walls of my simplices are deforming. OK. So. Again, I'm going to produce a deformation vector field. OK. Um, which describes how this whole tiling is, is deforming. And now, um, Now I need to check if it's contracting. So in fact, in this setting, we define x very explicitly. It's piecewise projective, um, and it's, it's very natural. Um, lemma, x is uniformly contracting, but only in positive directions. Okay, so, so the deformation is, is shrinking the geometry in these positive directions, but we can't control what it's doing in negative directions. Side note, what would you even want it to do in negative directions? Do you want the negative distances to become more negative or less negative? I don't know. Um, it's just annoying to think about that. And luckily, um, it doesn't matter um, because essentially, uh, this is okay because um, I'll write the limit set uh, is seen uh, by any any uh, point p in omega the compact family. Of positive directions. So, although the, the vector field might be doing weird things in these negative directions, if I start to orbit my tile with a very large element of the group, it's gonna it's gonna be very far away, very close to the limit set. There's some limit set here. You're meant to be imagining a picture somewhat like the limit set of a quasi-Fuchsian group in H3. Um, so this tile sees one of its orbits 
in a, in, in a negative, uh, sorry, in a positive direction. So indeed, we can conclude that any two faraway tiles are moving towards each other. And by projecting onto that compact, that compactly many positive directions, um, we, can, we can conclude that, that we have the uniform contraction that we need, and we can apply the same argument. So, um, get the, the action of W on the Lie algebra of OPQ. Um, okay, um, I'll stop there.